also about um, several other things that want and claim to be authoritative in our in our lives and in our spiritual journeys. So it's going to be an interesting discussion. And once again, thank you. So let us begin right away. Uh, please join me in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us breath this morning. Thank you for giving us help in this sick world. We pray for wisdom from on high to conduct ourselves uh, according to your will during this service. We ask that you bring uh, a willing audience to come and join us uh, from wherever they are. And Father, above all, glorify your name and advance your community today. We pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Okay, and I'm just going to throw this out there to whoever is watching. Uh, we talked about opening up this Sabbath school time to you folks, like if we incorporated a Zoom call so that we could interact with you in real time. And ultimately, I chose against that for today, but I want to kind of throw it out to whoever is watching and see if you have, uh, if that sounds like a good idea to you, either leave a comment on the video or contact me directly and let me know. Um, because if that's something you want to do, we'll set that up for future weeks. But without any further delay, brothers, sister, thank you for being here. And we get to talk about the Bible this morning. How are you all doing? Bless. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> good to be here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is good to be here. Mm -hmm. I don't know how often you get out of the house in a given week, but this <laughs> is usually the only time I get out of the house in a given week. So I'm deeply, deeply grateful for the opportunity to be here. Amen. So let's talk about this. We need to discuss tradition, experience, culture, reason, and then of course the Bible itself. Should be a very animated discussion. And we can start with, uh, by reading the very first paragraph here from the lesson, because I think that sets up our lesson very well. There is no Christian church that does not use scripture to support its beliefs. Yet the role and authority of Scripture in theology is not the same in all churches. In fact, the role of Scripture can vary greatly from church to church. This is an important but complex subject that we will explore by studying five different influential sources that impact our interpretation of Scripture. Uh, and those are what I already mentioned, tradition, experience, culture, reason, and the Bible itself. So let's begin with tradition. And my caution is be kind, <laughs> because I know that we, we don't always have such a favorable view of tradition. But uh, we are, we're in the minority on that, and most Christians in the world, world have a different understanding of the role of tradition. So let's be kind and hope we Spirit of the law, 
um, and trying to, and trying to you know, uh, keep with what they were teaching. Okay. Yeah, I believe uh, that our traditions uh, need to be examined from time to time. Uh, you know, as the pastor was saying, traditions are not always are not all bad, but traditions oftentimes uh, they sort of supersede the true word of God. So we have to be careful, and uh, you know, I just think that it would do us well to. Um, make sure that whatever traditions we do have, that they're based on the Word of God and not our own uh, feelings and emotions and uh, experiences that we've had with our churches or families and cultures and that type of thing. How easily do you think even we, with this kind of measured, cautious approach to tradition, sometimes fall into a victim of replacing tradition, uh, or replacing scriptural tradition anyway. How often do you think we, we fall into that trap? It's probably more often than you'd like to admit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so that's why it's good to examine what we're doing. I, and I, I keep... One of the things I, I listen to on a regular basis, at least when I was, I still do, but when I was driving back and forth to work, I don't do anymore because <laughs> I get to work from home. Nobody goes anywhere anymore. Don't go anywhere. But there's a, uh, I, I would listen to this daily audio Bible, get through the Bible, and I can do it in the morning. It takes 20 minutes each way, I mean 20 minutes to get there. And I'm doing this overview every year. I appreciate, I like that, because I like that overview. And one of the things that I keep noticing and is mentioned in some of the commentary with this is that when Israel was taken out of Egypt, they had no traditions. Really interesting point. They were slaves. Mm -hmm. They did what they were told to do. Now, they had traditions, because that's life. But as far as the knowledge of God, right. they didn't have anything. And so God had to establish, and we'll come kind to of this later too, culture with its traditions. Mm. Amen. Yeah, it's yeah, true. Yeah. And the traditions coming out of Egypt would have been entirely Egyptian traditions. And so God had to replace that somehow. Yes. And it's interesting that you bring that up because. Um, I think a lot of us can get bogged down in the rules that immediately follow the Exodus right, throughout mm -hmm. the next several books. And some of them make sense, but some of them kind of don't. And the only way to really make sense of the baffling rules is to recognize that God was specifically setting up a difference between the culture that he was establishing and the culture from which he took. And so the things that were common practice in Egypt, he just said, you don't do that. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and then we look at like, well, why, why can't I? Why can't I mix fabrics? You know, that's such a crazy rule. But it's because everything was mixed up in Egypt. So there's not, nothing inherently evil about like polyester or mixed fabric, mm -hmm. except that um, God was trying to remove them from a culture that was one way right. and establish a completely different culture in Right, they were saying, this is the way we do it, and this is the way we've done it. And so, within that tradition or that culture, uh, it becomes sort of a norm, and when it's not done, it's oftentimes looked upon as, well, this is going against God, when it's not going against God, it, it's going against man. It's a tradition that man has set up, and when it's not done in that that way, uh, you know, people are, are, are made to feel or put down and in and, and, and case with the, uh, with the Jews, the washing of hands. And there were some good things, but these things were so strict and so um, uh, they were determined to make sure that these things were just at the forefront. And when it didn't happen, it was almost looked upon as a sin. Mm. Well, I, I would, I, 
you have probably heard me say this because you're all members of my churches, so this is not new news if you pay attention to me in the real world. But one of the ways that our tradition um, goes specifically against what the scripture says is regarding the communion service. Mm -hmm. Because when we read through John 13, it's very clear that when supper was ended, they then progressed to the washing of the feet. And yet we have completely inverted that, mm -hmm. and we do all the, the washing of the feet first, mm -hmm. and then progress to the supper. Right. So I, in all of my years in the various churches I've served, I've only had one group of elders to whom I have brought that up who said, like, whoa, I never saw that before. Let's right. do it the Bible way. And, right. and there's a, a strong resistance to changing what we're Change. used to, yeah. even when we're confronted with yeah. the Bible. Because we've always done it that way. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when did it become a quarterly thing? Well, well right, instead of daily. So even, 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 even though, know, right. yes, we, we do have our traditions of what we look at. And, and I think somewhere somewhere in the reading of all this, I, I don't remember where now, but the idea came that we're very judgmental of mm. other people's traditions. Mm when we may have our own traditions that do wander around. They're, they're not wrong, but they do kind of wander around what the facts are. But then when we take the Last Supper, it was to do this to remember. Amen. Right. That was the key. Do this in remembrance of me. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Going against tradition, uh, it's 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 like going against the norm. You're stepping outside of the box, and you're doing something that's different than what um, the church people have always done. Uh, and so it's it's a challenge because it, it, it on the outside it appears as if that person is uh, rebelling against. Uh, the church when you know Jesus himself had several ways of talking to people even children and he had parables he, he didn't always stand in a temple or behind a pulpit he uh, you know he didn't dress as probably all of the people dressed back then because he walked around and he traveled. Sometimes he didn't have a place to lay his head, but he was the son of God. I was just going to, so what is the, uh, what is the problem with tradition? Well, I think we can actually consult Jesus himself for that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are, let, let's turn to Mark chapter 7. If you got your Bibles out there, we're going to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7. Mm -hmm. Please join us. And the story we're about to read is not unique to Mark. It appears elsewhere, too. But it's an important thing to understand. So Mark 7, and the, the passage is a long one. It's verses 1 through 13. Um, anyone feeling brave enough to read that for us? Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes, which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all of the Jews, except they wash their hands off, eat not. In other words, they didn't eat unless they washed their hands, which is a good thing. <laughs> holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash not, they eat not. And many other things there be, which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes ask him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders? but eat bread with unwashed hands. 
He answered and said unto them, Well, hath Esaias prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for the doctrines of the commandments of men. If you could just pause there. Sure. Um, we should keep reading because Jesus is not done giving us the lesson. But right there, even if we stop right there, mm -hmm. it is a powerful thought to me that when we mix up doctrines with commandments, when we make that error, mm -hmm. Jesus just plainly told us, worship becomes vain. Right. That's, I mean, that should be a sobering thought. Yes. So please continue. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the traditions of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother. And whoso curses father or mother, let him die to death. But ye say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, that is, to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things ye do. Yeah, that, there we go. That is the end of the passage we're to read. Um, the Corbin example is a really interesting one because we, we can get kind of wrapped up around the axle with these little things like my like order of communion service that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. But that's not really what Jesus is talking about, at least through the Corbin example. But the Corbin example, um, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, um, Jesus uses this as an example of what they were doing wrong. Because the actual commandment of God, the actual instruction is to honor your father and your mother. Mm -hmm. And then the negative consequence uh, for breaking that would be he who curses father and mother should die. Right? Right. And so that's the actual thing. It's all about loving your parents and mm -hmm. respecting your elders and being uh, servants to them. And the way that the culture in Jesus' time had internalized that was, I, I don't really want to do that. I, I'm in the prime of my life. They're old, they're a burden on me. I don't want to help them out. So the way that I get around the commandment is now I, uh, I gift my house to the church. So now my house is holy, it doesn't belong to me anymore. And so what if my aged parent now is homeless? Mm -hmm. right? But look how holy I am because I gave it to the church. Right. Right? And so this is completely missing the whole point of the commandment in the first place. It's not right. mixing up a little detail here. Right. It's, it's a complete adulteration of what God was trying to do in the first place. Yeah. Look at the other thought there. <laughs> yeah, well, this next verse, I mean, this paragraph here, uh, it says the tradition Jesus confronted was carefully handed down in the Jewish community. community from teacher to pulpit. In Jesus' day, it had assumed a place alongside scripture. Tradition, however, has a tendency to grow over long periods of time, thus accumulating more and more details that, and aspects that were not originally part of God's word and plan. These human traditions, even though they are promoted by respected elders, for example, by the religious leaders of the Jewish community, are not equal to God's commandments. They were human traditions, and ultimately they led to a point where they made the word of God of no effect. So what do we do with that? How can we safeguard against that? Well, again, I, we, we safeguard it through the word of God, number one, and we examine that with ourselves, and we 
uh, you know, continue asking for God's Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us. And I don't know what the Jews were missing. Then, but, uh, a lot of things were steeped in their traditions. And uh, they, for some reason or another, became headstrong and, and determined that they, were, they wanted it done their way. And when it wasn't, then it was against the God and the church. So we guard against it through the, through the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit and through God's word. Okay, I like that answer. I am not necessarily convinced that it's that easy. <laughs> not that easy. <laughs> but I do like the answer. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not that easy. Because it requires... Uh, determination, daily communion, and having and, and being willing. If we are willing, God is able. Sometimes it's us who will prevent. The only begotten of God was sent. Came down from heaven through Mary's womb, rose from a grave in a dusty tomb. We need to lay all the cards down on the table. If we are willing, God is able. And so, when we are willing and when we are asking God for His guidance, then we can uh, safeguard. Uh, ourselves from some of these uh, uh, things, some of these traditions that can overtake us if we, if we allow that to happen. Um, so I'm going to read. I'm going to read something as another example of the trouble that we sometimes encounter with tradition. I'm going to ask for grace here. Remember that this is Ellen White's words, not mine. <laughs> And in case you want to look it up, it was printed in Review and Herald, March 24, 1868. It's reprinted in Second Selected Messages, page 338. It says the following. And what I want you to do is, as I'm reading is to think about the baptismal vows that we require people to make before they join the church today. Okay? So here's what, what Sister White has to say. In answer to many inquiries, we would say that we believe there is business for Seventh-day Adventists to enter upon for a livelihood which are more consistent with their faith than the raising of hops, tobacco, or swine. Okay, so that's alcohol production, tobacco production, and the raising of pigs, which are unclean meat. Mm -hmm. And she goes on and she underscores and says, we would recommend that they plant no more hops or tobacco fields and that they reduce the number of their swine. They may yet see it duty, as most consistent believers do, to keep no more of these things. We would not urge this opinion upon any. She's saying, it's up to your conscience. We as the church are not going to urge that to mm -hmm. you. Much less would we take the responsibility of saying, plow up your hop and tobacco fields and sacrifice your swine to the dogs. Right? Mm -hmm. So she's, she's pivoting here and saying, yeah, this is probably not really the best thing for you and your faith. But we as a church, we're not going to make you do this, mm -hmm. nor certainly will we tell you to destroy the way that you're earning your life because mm -hmm. of these principles. Right. Then, it gets really strong here. While we would say to those who are disposed to uh, crowd hop tobacco and swine growers among our people that they have uh, no right to make these things in any sense a test of Christian fellowship. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. And yet today, wow. we require people to vow before God mm -hmm. that they will not participate in these things, uh, not even in the production of those things. We're not even supposed to support the business of these things. So how did we go from this, which was one of the few joint statements that Ellen made with her husband James? Right. How did we go from that to this? Well, it goes to show how uh, tradition oftentimes, or, or, or man's own thoughts instead of God's prophetic revelation through his prophets or his messengers can oftentimes change the way we think or can become a, a norm. Okay, but I, I think my argument is that if we believe that Sister White was in fact a messenger from God, we seem to have gotten away from the message of God into this like much more culture-based, restrictive idea 
that we're now blaming on God when the direct instruction from God was the opposite of what we're doing. I agree. <laughs> I'll leave my comments right there. <laughs> we have gotten away from uh, other things as well, but uh, I think this lesson is good in that it reminds us that we need to uh, uh, make sure that we're not putting traditions above the, the sure word of God. And, and, and so, yeah, when you do that, it's, you can for easily forget. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, based on how this is going, I think we could probably talk about this for the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm just thinking, should I put it in a can of worms or not? I think I'll just be quiet right now. <laughs> right. Um, so let's move on to experience, and if we have time, we can come back okay. to this. <laughs> I hope so. Well, actually, I hope we get to reason. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. But we, but they all build to each other. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I will be patient. Well, let's let's uh, read let's read Romans two four since we're in the New Testament, kind of close to Romans. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter two verse four. Uh, the New King James Version here says, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? And I think the point of that is recognizing that our Christian experience is somehow related to God directly. Like, we don't just learn about God, we actually experience God. I repent not because you tell me to, Mm -hmm. But because the love of God, His incredible right. grace toward me, leads me to that point where I just don't want to be the same anymore. Right. And so this is the good way, I think, that experience can influence us as Christians. That we should all have a direct one-on-one -on -one experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, it's commonly said God doesn't have any grandchildren. I mean, it's true because unless you actually know Him, I mean, it's, it's, it brings us back to the parable of the ten virgins. You know, what were the difference between the two? They all had the Bible. They all knew, you know, their word. But it was the experience that they had that separated them, you know, between the two. And, and actually were able to tie them through the this, this storm, you know, the, 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 um, the trials. Amen. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. So it sounds like we're in agreement on that. But how can experience be a negative thing? How can it negatively impact in, usually when I think of experience, any experiences, we remember certain experiences because of the emotion that's tied to it. Okay. And, and I think that's where sometimes we let emotion be our guide rather than rationality or the Bible. This is a strong emotion for me, therefore, it must be correct. <laughs> yeah, I think that is a real danger. Thank you for bringing that up. It's, <laughs> it reminds me of um, some satire that I see on the internet um, making fun of Christian worship. And it's all done in love because it's actually mm, a Christian-friendly publication. But um, ever, ever since everything shut down, Mm -hmm. And churches like us have had to go to virtual experiences instead mm -hmm. of gatherings anymore. You know, they, they print these tongue-in-cheek articles about um, uh, how Christians have to learn to experience the Holy Spirit without the fog machine for the first time. You know, because <laughs> Christian worship, is maybe not in this particular flavor of Christianity, but in many denominations and non-denominations, is about the lights and the music and the smoke and the experience of being there. And then as soon as you go home and that experience isn't there anymore, it's like, what did you get out of that? I got a good feeling out of that. Right. That's all I really got. Yeah. I mean, it clouds the reality of, of uh, the truth oftentimes, or the, God's word, God's word only. It clouds it and it leaves it to some emotional feeling that you get behind a 
maybe a song or maybe a certain way of a person saying something all the time that you heard your parents or whoever said. And so, uh, you know, again, we, we have to be careful that we are not caught up in the, uh, the, the sens over sensationalism, if you will, of God's worship experience, his true worship experience. And uh, Amen. like I said, it's, it's not always the easiest thing to do. But uh, well, well, how about this? Right, people come to church for all sorts of different reasons, right? Mm -hmm. But what if the reason is because they really enjoy Jerry's Sabbath school, or they really enjoy learning about health from Dr. Bowman, they really enjoy Stanley's music, they really enjoy the pastor who's friendly and who preaches a good message, and it's all about the people. Why is that a danger to wrap up your experience around people? You know, I've had lots of friends who, um, yeah, it's happened to all of us, you know, because people, the people that make up a church are human. And so humans will, you know, will fail us sometimes. And so mm. when you make mm. your whole experience sometimes. around people <laughs> and not on God, God will never fail us. Right. It might seem like, you know, you know, even Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? He hasn't. And so it might feel like it, but people will always fail us at some point. And so when you make your experience all about people and then they fail you, then you stop coming to church. Right. When you stop coming to church, you stop reading your Bible. Eventually, you're going to stop reading your Bible if you ever read it in the first place. Right. Um, or else, and then you start, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then, and then, um, and then, you know, and then you stop, you know, just, and, and you say, oh, I'm going to go out to, you know, to nature to be my, you know, to have my Sabbath there. Eventually that's going to be, you know, um, you know, replaced as well. So when you really put your faith in people, it really puts you on that slippery slope. Yeah. And I've, I've, I don't know how many people I've told that to in the past, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's, it, it really hurts me. I, I have frequently over the years when I'm studying with somebody in one-on-one -on -one or a small group, there usually comes a point where they're enjoying the studies, they're, they're enjoying what we're doing, and so then they, they begin to, like, thank me for it. You know, and so I have frequently arrested them in that moment. And said, "No, no, this is not about me. If you make it about me, you're going to be disappointed because I will let you down someday. I can, I can virtually guarantee someday you're going to be disappointed or hurt by me. And if your experience is wrapped up in me, then yeah. you're setting yourself up." It reminds me of uh, uh, of John when he saw the angel in Revelation chapter 22. He fell down on his knees to worship before the feet of the angel that told him these things and then the angel he said don't do that right he said see thou do it not for I'm thy fellow servant and of thy brother and the prophets Amen. and of them which keep the sayings of this book worship God and so you know we have to not be so gullible as to get caught up in you know the the, 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 the speaker the singer you know and, and, and again it's not it's not easy to not or to do rather because we enjoy hearing a good sermon from uh, a good speaker we have some of the best speakers in the world and so we enjoy listening to them and, but too often I think uh, that we get caught up in wanting to hear a a, a uh, a style of preaching a certain way and when we don't hear it we're looking for that again and again and you know we and we don't put God before we do the actual experience that we have had in the past we want that experience again and again and I'll tell you in the age of coronavirus when suddenly Christianity is virtual I, I, I'm concerned about this. I'm concerned about it every year camp meeting too, that we we spend so much energy making a good production mm. that people want to watch. And it's like, okay, then what are we, are we actually connecting you with God or are you just watching some great TV right now? Yeah. That's a, that's a good point you make because that conversation has come up before uh, that 
you know, oftentimes we get caught up in making sure that we're on the time schedule, making sure that it's yeah. done a certain way, a certain time, and when we step out of that, it's, oh no, we can't have our audience, you know, we, this is just not, God wants us to have it, you know, decent and in order, but what if the Holy Spirit just happens to come as it did at Pentecost and it just, just decide to do it a completely different way? Would you be open to doing it that way or would you be caught up in your way as a tradition? Uh, for those of you who are intending to watch the whole worship service, Brother Stanley, without even realizing it, is giving you a preview of my sermon today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Pastor. <laughs> no, 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 nothing to be sorry about. Uh, I love that. That means the Lord is speaking to you the same way He spoke to me earlier in the week. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, amen. So, okay, again, we're somehow shorter on time than I wanted to be at this point in the discussion. So let's move on to culture. And this one, man, this is, this can be poison. Culture can get us every time here. Um, let's go to the book of 1 John. First John is toward the back of your Bibles, for those of you who are maybe new to the Bible. It is not the Gospel of John. It's one of those little books with a number in front of it toward the end. First John chapter 2. And these few verses, I'm looking at verses 15 through 17. Um, just so powerful. Mm -hmm. So clear, so straight to the heart. And yet... I think every single believer all throughout time has struggled with these three verses. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Sister Jane, would you mind reading it to us? Sure. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Amen. I mean, amen indeed, right? Amen. So we're, we're confronted with three problems here. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And I believe, and I teach, that every single problem we ever have in all of life ultimately boils down to one or more of these three things. Yes, you're right. Even the temptations of Jesus... And in, in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, Satan got Same Eve thing. by attacking mm -hmm. all three of these things at mm -hmm. once. And so, um, we live in a very visual culture. Right. And so the lust of the eyes is really strong mm -hmm. here. I mean, I think it's clearly always been really strong, but here, in mm -hmm. our digital culture, yes. um, it harkens to what I was saying with regard to Christian worship right now in this, right. in this lockdown. We're, we're trying to make it visually appealing, so mm -hmm. it looks good. And right. I even fell into this uh, earlier this week when I stumbled into kind of what some of the other churches are doing. I began to get a little jealous because we're mostly just kind of recording us bumping into each other here, but some of the churches are making like these huge, gorgeous productions. And I, I spent about a day or two feeling jealous and thinking we should be doing more mm -hmm. until it occurred to me like I, I'm, I'm falling into the trap of the lust of the eyes here. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, I uh, ab absolutely, I, I concur. Uh, the technology that we have in these times that we live is, is astounding, and I believe that we need to dedicate our cell phones, we need to dedicate our time to God more so now than ever, we need to get that old clock watch and put it in there so we won't have to sit our phones down next to our beds and wait for the, I mean, and, and look at the time. And because this television, it's a phone, but it's also a television. It's, uh, it can steal our time. And I, I'm, I'm speaking from my own experience. It can steal our time because we have our families there. We have everything that's there that we live and we are business and so it's it's easy to make an excuse of well the lesson is on the phone and the lesson is here and there but it's not all the time that people are on their phones on the lesson when they're in the audience they may be on Facebook 
So I know this again from experience. <laughs> so, you know, but, uh, you know, I'm just, I want to bring this home because uh, I think that we need to make sure we have a, a Bible that we don't use the phone as a, as a, a babysitting tool for our kids and, and, it's, and it's serious, it's that serious and Satan is using it and we just need to be careful. We need to be led by the Spirit and we need to cancel out our time we spend on just things that photographs and pictures and things and all that, which is on the phone. Mm. And so there's more time there and not in the, just the Word of God. So, well, How about the lust of the flesh? Now usually when we talk about that we end up talking about sex and drugs and things mm -hmm. that make us feel good. But I want to take again a kind of an age of coronavirus perspective here. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that the culture around us is scared to death of death? <coughs> Uh, let me let me kind of explain a little bit. Um, there was a there was a news conference with uh, one of our fifty governors, and I'm not going to be political. I won't say who. But in this news conference, the question was asking like, um, "Do you believe there is such a thing as what you're instructing us to do in our lockdown being worse than the reason we're locked down in the first place?" And his answer was no, because the alternative is death. Nothing's worse than, worse than death. And so the reporter asked like three or four different times, trying to be like, well, what about drug addiction? What about domestic violence that's on the rise? What about these you know, people are unemployed? They're, they're, they're hopeless. They're doing, and he said, no, no, no nothing, nothing's worse than death. Uh, we, we have to do what we're doing because the alternative is death. And I just, as I'm listening to this, I said, <laughs> my goodness, is there really nothing, nothing worse than death? Do you, I'm, and maybe I, I don't want to be cavalier here, but I don't think that that's true. No, I think there are all not. sorts of things worse than death. Absolutely. Are you opening up a can of worms here? <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> but Absolutely. But it's, but it's true. I mean, even in this you know, age, you know, um, the, you know, gun sales have gone through the roof. Even people who, you know, who, didn't, who were against guns in the first place, they went out and got, bought a gun. Why? Because they're afraid, afraid. of death. Mm -hmm. right. So before you kill me, I'm going to kill you first. Mm -hmm. right. you know, and that's the whole mentality of it. And right. so it just doesn't make sense. Notice how wise our God in heaven is and how, how he does certain things. Now, uh, he allowed and he oftentimes has, has used these types of experiences to draw men to him draw his children to him those I think that who uh, would be borderline or would be thinking about God now think about him more because of the virus those who perhaps uh, would have made a decision later on or not made a decision they're making a decision now because they're on their deathbed but they're making a decision for God maybe they died of the coronavirus but what they did before they died, they gave their hearts to God. God wants to save us. That's what he ultimately wants to do. So uh, while, yes, many are afraid and, and no one wants to contract something like a coronavirus, but there's much worse things. Dying without Jesus and, and his amen. Amen. love for us. Hey, absolutely, amen. And so... I, I mean, I just liken that to lust of the flesh. Maybe it doesn't feel good to just be living my normal life, but I'm so scared of the pain of the virus, or I'm so right. scared of the pain of death, that I'm kind of coveting my flesh as it is. And I, I'm likely to make bad choices if that's my entire focus. Right. I wanna, there's one thing I want to correct, too. I won't, not correct, but there's a disclaimer sort of in that God is not one to be tempted because we want to prove that we are his children and we can go out, we can do whatever we want, we can violate whatever it is that would not protect us or protect us from this virus. He wants us to follow the guidelines, but I think he steps in when we can't 
if we forget, he steps in. If he's, but I don't think he wants us to uh, go against what our health professionals already know that will make us get this virus. You know, I really don't. I think that he wants us to follow the guidelines. I think he wants us to do all that we can do according to the laws of man. But if they go against the laws of God, then that's a different Sorry. thing. Yeah. That's a different thing. So, go ahead. Go ahead. One more thing here on that First John 2, 15 to 17. It led to how it ends in verse 17, which basically the world is passing away. And if that's not clear, my goodness. <laughs> and then I, I wrote down another thought okay. to go with that. Yes, the world is passing away. But we want, to, we want this relationship with God because God is forever. And so can we be when we are with God. In fact, that is the only way. Amen. That, and, and, and I guess that's why some people could be so worried about death because they do not know yeah. or recognize that there is a God. Mm -hmm. Amen. I mean, I, I've, I've had thoughts like this also. Um, I, I wonder if everything else was the same in our technology, in our culture, everything was the same except that we were closer to God as a culture. How much different would the coronavirus experience be? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's something we maybe can investigate up in heaven when we get to read the books. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are running out of time, and Brother Jerry really wanted to talk about reason. So I am going to turn the page to reason, and I'm going to let you say what's been on your heart, brother. It had to do with one of the questions, so I'm I'm going to use I'm going to use uh, the four of us sitting here as an example, and each of us represent a point. So, how many points are there? Four. Four. So, this is what is known as four point geometry, okay. and. And I like the reason that goes with it, and hopefully we'll get up to a quick conclusion. But in four-point geometry, there are points and there are lines. There are three axioms, and axioms are what are accepted as true. So, first point, there are exactly four points. Second point, any two distinct points can have exactly one line through them. Okay. Which means we're not going to be in our standard form in, in one after the other. We're kind of spread out in a different orientation here. And each line is exactly on two points. Okay. So if I put a line from here to there, that meets the conditions. Okay. Here, 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 here. You can do it all around. So there's a bunch of different lines. My question is, does a line across this way and a line across that way intersect? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what is the intersection of that point, of that line, of those lines? It's another point. Except there's only four points. <laughs> Therefore, if there are only four points, do those two lines intersect? Not if we accept. So they, they pass. Not, yeah, exactly. Not if we accept that there are only going to be four points. Right. And I was, as I was thinking about and reading through some of this, I, reason, what we choose to believe in is based on what our beginning axioms and the things that we believe are. Amen. And if we believe a certain way based on what we have 
found to be true, based on the Bible, then we will have a certain set of beliefs. Amen. Now, four-point geometry, is it based in reality? Yes. Uh, I'm going to say yes, although you're kind of... Well, you're I know. Here, so <laughs> but reason, it, it would have to be based on faith, too, in the Word of God, because as the Bible says, you know, that faith is that substance of things that's hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. He says, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. But then, you know, Jesus, he also says, come let us reason together. And so reason is, is important, it's, it's good because, but it has to be based on something. It, has to, it can't be just arbitrary. Uh, it can't just be, it has to be reason that is uh, 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 reasonable when it comes to the true word of God. The only thing I can see The that. reason I thought of this is because I took a class called Modern Geometries. Mm -hmm. and these were a whole series of geometries which some of them we use and some of them we don't because they are exercises in expanding logic. And I like them for that, but it also for me simply points out if we start with a certain set of beliefs, we could end up with an entirely different understanding of things. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important to establish what are your personal beliefs Amen. in respect to God. Because if we don't establish that, and we don't say, if we say, well, God is, God doesn't exist, then there's a lot of things that we simply reject mm. because there is no God. Or if we say God doesn't intervene directly in our lives, then we start rejecting a bunch of things because that's not our belief. So we need to be careful about how we set up our beliefs and also how we try and talk to people because if their set of beliefs is completely different than ours, the first step is not to argue the points of the beliefs. Are you sure? I'm just kidding. <laughs> the first step is not to argue the points of the beliefs, but to find out what those beliefs are and why. And I think that's where the reasoning comes in. Let us reason together is, here's what I have to present to you. Now let's talk about it. I, so I like reasoning, but because of reasoning, you can end up completely somewhere else. Four-point geometry, in my mind, is not reality because we don't live in a universe of four points. That's interesting. By the way, can you tell this man is an educator? <laughs> <laughs> Very well done. Thank you for, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Well, we need to wrap up, so I'm looking for closing thoughts. We didn't get to the Thursday lesson. We didn't talk about the Bible directly. We used the Bible to talk about these other things, but we didn't actually talk about the Bible. So, uh, is the Spirit speaking to any of your hearts in terms of a closing thought that can tie it into the Scripture, why the Bible needs to be the central authority in our lives and let it color everything else instead of letting them color the Bible? Any ideas? I think what Mr. Corson said is just perfect. I mean, if, you know, really, what what is our cornerstone? It needs to be Jesus and the Word. And so, without without a good foundation, the the house falls. Amen. It's quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the, of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's Hebrews four twelve. Yes. Yeah, Hebrews 4.12, if you want to look that up. But very good. <laughs> Neither is there any creature that's not manifest in his sight. Hallelujah. Uh, well, we are going to wrap up now. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for spending this uh, hour or so with us. Uh, I enjoyed this conversation Amen. very much. Uh, thank you to my brothers and my sister for being here and, and facilitating this discussion with me. Um, as you know, if you're tuning in for a, a, a 
several weeks in a row, you know we're going to take a little break now. There will be some announcement slides and videos for you to watch, and then we will reconvene at 10.45 Pacific time for our worship service. So uh, let us pray. Um, Brother Stanley, would you mind praying for us? Father in heaven, we thank you for this Sabbath, for waking us up this morning to see another beautiful day. Lord, we know that everything in the heavens and the earth is yours. This is your kingdom. And we adore you as being in control of everything. Lord, riches and honor comes from you and you alone, and you are ruler of all mankind, and your hand controls power and might, and it is at your discretion that men are made great and given strength. Lord, we, are, we ask for that strength. We ask that you would continue to uh, be with us during these times that we live. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you protect uh, the churches, Father, and all your children, Father. Uh, in the name of Jesus, we pray for his sake. Amen. Amen. See you soon. Good morning. Today, <laughs> we are going to talk about being perfect. Can somebody raise their hand and tell me, maybe not tell me, just raise your hand and tell somebody next to you if you are perfect or not. I don't hear anything because nobody is perfect. Only God is perfect. So we're going to do a demonstration today and we're going to have our candle that's going to represent sin and our balloons are going to represent our connection with God. Now, before I do this, I'm going to put some protective eye gear on because that's good to when you do demonstrations to be safe. I couldn't find my normal um, science glasses, so this is what I have today. And my mustache is like Mr. Corson's. So, what are some things that you have done before? What are some sins that we've done that might break our connection with God? Can you think of any? Maybe, let's say lied to somebody and what happens when you come into my huh it breaks okay our candle went out I will light that again what are some other things now I'm afraid to do it again um, maybe you said unkind things about somebody or you stole something these are all things that Huh, it's kind of scary. Uh, sin is a scary thing to do. So we know that our connection, when we come into contact with sin, our connection with God is broken. But I have good news. Let's have this person. Again, this represents our connection, but inside we have water, and the water is going to represent salvation. Um, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that, who, uh, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes will have eternal life. He'll have salvation. And the Bible talks about how, <clears throat> excuse me, about how salvation is like buckets of water from the, you get buckets of water from the wells of salvation. Or you get living water flows from us with salvation. So this person has accepted Jesus. Jesus has, gives us salvation, and so Satan's always trying to tempt us, and so we always come into contact with sin. But this person comes into contact with sin. What happens? Our salvation is, Jesus is our salvation, and he keeps our connection with God going. It is our connection with God isn't broken when we accept Jesus. Is it great? Should I put it all the way over, do you think? Or put it out? Mm. Wow. Okay, so our balloon may burn a little bit, but it has not broken our connection with God. So we're going to remember that sometimes we do bad things and our connection with Jesus is broken. Our connection with God is broken. But Jesus can uh, make our connection with God okay because we have accepted him and we have salvation in our lives. So I want you to remember that when we have Jesus in our lives, we can always be connected to God. Have a good day.